Glory to God. Glory, glory, glory. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. My Redeemer, my Savior, may you use me as a vessel to bring this message to your people. My Lord, my rock, and my strength. I give you all the glory and I give you all the honor. And I give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Maxwell, Lady Maxwell, the diaconate and my East French Baptist Church. May the Lord continue to bless you, bless your children, and bless your families. My sermon today is from Matthew 27, verse 46. Matthew 27, verse 46. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Please stand for the reading of the word, if, you, if you're able to. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So my title today is, I Didn't. Uh, so look at your neighbor and you say, he didn't. He did. Now look at your other neighbor and say it with a little bit more attitude and say, he didn't. He did. Thank you. <laughs> no, he didn't. To forsake someone means to abandon them or turn away from them. So when friends and family forsake you, you feel lonely, abandoned, unwanted, and hurt. Imagine for a moment what was happening to Jesus at this point in time. Judas, his chief accountant, had just forsaken him and sold him for a measly 30 pieces of silver. And Peter, his rock, had just denied him three times. John, his BFF, was watching him from afar with his mother. And then the rest of the disciples were hiding and nowhere to be found. Jesus had been beaten, ridiculed all day and all night. He was tired, bloodied, and had nothing to eat or drink all day. He was in complete and utter physical and mental anguish. In those days, the way the Romans hung you, they, they would do it in such a way that it would inflict the most physical pain possible while killing you slowly. They would put one foot on top of the other and drive the nails to hold your feet into, into the cross. They will make sure that the nail was in between a nerve so it would inflict the, the maximum pain and suffering. They will stretch your arms wide and drive the nails into your palms. This was done so that you had difficulty breathing and then every time you tried to pull yourself up, the nail that was on your feet would hit the nerve and cause pain. But while you're trying to stay down, your arms would get dislocated from your body. So imagine that kind of pain that you was going through. He's trying to breathe and get some breath into his lungs, while at the same time trying to not dislocate his arms. So the Bible tells us that Jesus was in this position for six long hours. I don't know about you, but I know I would have passed out the moment that they put the first nail into my palm. Seriously. Yet Jesus, in this most difficult and painful time of his life, managed to put all his affairs into place. He was able to conduct uh, an adoption, and he, and, and was also able to forgive the, the exact same people that had put him on the cross. And he still managed to cry out to God in prayer. It was a prayer in the form of a question, which lets us see the human side of him as he was asking the question to divinity. That's because his feelings, which were under excruciating pain, were overtaking his spirit. His prayer at the critical hour was a question and not a statement of fact, as it represents real, tangible feelings and pain that you and I can relate to. So therefore, today I'd like to talk to you about two things from this text. I'd like to talk to you about the significance of Jesus dying on the ninth hour or the eighth watch. And then the second one 
What do you do when life beats you upside your head? The Bible says it was about the ninth hour when Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When you examine the prayer watches, the ninth, the ninth hour, which is from 3 to 6 p.m., is the eighth watch. It's the hour of dying to self and rejoicing in the power of Jesus Christ. So Jesus took on the sins of man so that he can be reconciled to God through his blood. The eighth, the eighth watch is the hour of prayer of covenant and power and triumph and glory. It's the time for us to move any limiting factors in your lives. It's the hour of grace and hour of removing any veils or any pretenses we may have. This is the time to die of the world and to die yourself. And this is the time when you seek the Lord in truth and ask him for his will in our lives. In the Jewish tradition, the eighth watch or the 3 to 6 p.m. hour is also the time of the evening sacrifice. The time of the slaying and offering of the daily sacrifice, which was an Im imminent type of Christ. So the eighth watch is also the time the Passover was killed. So it's really, it's not a coincidence that Christ died on the eighth watch. He is the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. He had no blemishes and he had no sin and he was offered up as a perfect and living sacrifice for our salvation. So Christ's cry on the cross shows us the truth of Christ's human nature that was in all things made like us. He had a human soul. He endured sorrows and suffering in it, of which forsaken or abandoned was part of it. So then, what do you do when life beats you upside your head? Like Jesus, we all at some point in our lives felt abandoned, forsaken, lonely, helpless, and even questioned the very existence of God. We have felt like the world is coming to an end and God is simply not hearing us or just choosing to ignore us. You have been laid off for work. Your rental mortgage is past due. Your child is hooked on drugs and alcohol. Your spouse doesn't even come home. He's out at his mistress's house. You find out you have cancer and all your friends and family have abandoned you. And to make matters worse, your neighborhood is being taken over by drug dealers. And you just don't know what to do or who to, who to turn to. Friends, I believe that when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was showing us what to do in times like this. He was calling out the scriptures in Psalm 21, 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what scriptures are you calling out when you're in pain? So even in the depth of his suffering and his cruciating pain, Jesus still knew that God was God. Yeah. He was calling out to God, the only one that can never forsake him. Who do you call when you feel abandoned and all alone? Do you get down on your knees and say, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. So what scriptures are you calling out? The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. It doesn't say that you stay in the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say that you camp in the valley of the shadow of death. It clearly says you will walk through it. And God will be with you at all times. He will never, ever forsake you. The Bible also tells us that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So pain and sorrow will come your way. Trust me, it will come your way at some point. It's God's way of strengthening your faith muscles and drawing you closer to him. If you trust him and know that he rose from the dead, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of our life. You will dwell in the house of the Lord. 
Jesus says to call on God. He will never forsake you. He died so that we can be free from pain. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. I just want to remind you today that although we go through some painful situations, just like Jesus, God knows the seed he's put in you. He knows what you can and cannot handle. He is our creator. So he knows what he put inside of each one of us. Just remember that God will never put you through any that, anything that he has not given you the strength right. or will to overcome. Right. He'll never forsake you. God knew the pain and sorrow that his beloved son had to endure. And yet, you still let him go through it because he knew that at the end of it all, Jesus will conquer hell death and the grave so i know prayer moves the hand of god so stop trying to so stop trying to be like god and think you can fix everything that is wrong in your life that's god's job to do that so take it to god in prayer if jesus can do it so can we we each have our own crosses to bear and some crosses are heavier than others but you have to remember that Jesus already died for our iniquities and our transgressions, and no one can ever change that. It's already been done. So the next time you find yourself going through life storms and whirlwinds, remember that it may just be God calling us to die to self and to live for Christ. So can you hear God talking to you in the midst of that storm? You're asking God, why did you leave me? And God is saying, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I am with you in the storm, through the storm, and after the storm. Yes. So, friends, I ask you today to surrender your all to God at all times. We don't have to bear our crosses on our own. Jesus already carried that for us. He will carry them for us in the future. So, yes, trials and tribulations will come our way. Yes, you may lose your home. You may lose your job. You may lose your friends and family. But God commands us to have certain spiritual calmness or stillness that comes from a steady, deep reflection of knowing that he died, was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. He conquered all sin, all sorrow, and all, and all death. So trust me, all is well. The answers to the outcomes we are looking for may not come when we want them to come, but believe me, they are always on time and always tailor-made for you. So stop taking matters into your own hands and let God be God. Nothing is impossible with God. No burden is too light or too heavy for him. There is nothing he won't do for you. Just call on him and trust him. Jesus has already conquered all trials and tribulations we'll go through. He died on the cross for you and me. And for that reason, God will never forsake him. We are forever victorious in, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are forever victorious. Everybody, again. Listen, can we take this moment and give God the best praise that we can give him? Is that your best? Oh, come on. Is that your best? Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Now, stay right there. Stay right there. We got to charge the atmosphere. Come on, keep worshiping. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Come on and lift them up. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, and I pray that you do, for we are all soldiers in the army of the Lord, and we need to carry our sword. How can you fight without a sword? <laughs> I want to draw your attention to uh, the book of John, chapter 19, verse 28. And it reads us thus, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, 
that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith I thirst. You may take your seats. So that we are all clear out of the seven statements made by Jesus from the cross, the statement, I thirst, is the only statement that can be attributed to his personal physical suffering. It's amazing because the Bible details a lot of the torture that Jesus went through. Uh, he was whipped. They say, I believe it was a cat of nine tails. Something like a leather. Uh, it had the leather straps and on the end of it, it had that metal. And so when the man threw it, it ripped the skin of Jesus. Some scholars say that it ripped his skin all the way down to where you could see his ribs. I can't even imagine. And that was not just one lick. They didn't just hit him once. It was a game to the soldier. They enjoyed torturing Jesus. Some scholars would even say that the beard of Jesus was torn from his face. But even the inhumane torture that he endured as referenced in our Bibles and described by preachers, I described a little bit of it. It's amazing that now on the cross, Jesus uttered the words, I thirst. Throughout the torture and the beatings and being spat upon and slapped and slapped and slapped again. He never said, oh, my face. He never said, oh, my back. He never said, when they put the crowns of, uh, uh, that crown of thorn on his head and they mashed it. He never said, oh, my head. Uh, the songwriter says he never said a mumbling word. That's what he said. Throughout all of that, he never said a mumbling word. And so again, now on the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. Now he's hanging there on the cross, bloody and disfigured, drenched in his own blood and sweat. No doubt there are bugs and flies swarming about his body due to the stench and the smell of death. And maybe even buzzards and other carnivorous birds are circling in the air, inching closer and closer as Jesus continues to languish in agony. Even those lowered beings, being the insects and the birds, they even sensed that Jesus is getting ready to die. But wait. Let's go back to John 1928. Now, I hope y'all still got your Bible with you. Um, I hope you didn't close it. Don't, don't sheath your sword just yet. Now, it says, and can y'all read it with me? Can we do this together? Now, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, stop right there. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. What's the scripture that needs to be fulfilled, sister preacher? Well, I'm so glad you asked. 
a messianic prophecy or prophecy written in the Old Testament for telling the coming of the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, can be found in Psalms 69, verse 21, where it says, They gave me also gall for my food, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, when you read the entire account of the crucifixion found in the synoptic books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and let's not forget John's account of the crucifixion, you will see the relevance of Psalm 69, 21, as it pertains to John 19 and 28, about the gall and the vinegar to drink. I don't have much time to go into that. Pastor said that we have a certain amount of time. And operating in the spirit of obedience, um, I am going to follow the words of the man of God. Now, this fifth saying of Jesus while on the cross was a twofold expression of his need. Am I running out of time? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Bless your daughter. Now, first, it was needful for our Savior to do the will of his Father. And in doing so, he fulfilled, here it is again, every messianic prophecy from the Old Testament. Taking care to not overlook Psalm 69 and 21. Now, bear in mind, Jesus, even after everything that he's gone through, he still has clarity of mind. Because I, if you read, as I said, the full account of the crucifixion, he was offered a drink that had gall and, and some said frankincense because gall is bitter, but the frankincense kind of makes it sweet. And the drink was offered because it's said to have medicinal value. But Jesus, wanting to keep all of his faculties, said no. Uh -uh. He refused that drink. That's right, you can't medicate me. I need to be clear of mind. Now, secondly, by obeying his body's thirst and managing to extract a few drops of the Roman soldiers' pasca or vinegar, also known as vinegar wine in some biblical translations, from the soldier sponge attached to the end of a hyssop branch. Oh, this sounds familiar, but I can't go into it because I have only a few minutes of time. But I will, I will recall to your remembrance that uh, while the Israelites were still <laughs> in Egypt, uh, the last plague was coming, and it wasn't even a plague. Was it a plague, Pastor? It's a plague, all right. My pastor said it's a plague, so it's a plague. I honor the, the, the word of the man of God. It was a plague. And so before it came, God gave Moses instructions. And he told Moses to tell the people specifically to get the hyssop branch and, and put on it. Uh, 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 what was it, Pastor? He said he wanted to put some, you know, I got to refer to you because, you know, I'm under your tutelage. So I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to do anything wrong, but to make a long story short, <laughs> rather than a short story long, <laughs> as we preachers do, <laughs> in the Old Testament, the hyssop was part of what was needed 
to spread the blood of the lamb over the door. So that death will pass over because he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Well, I'm going to move on to the second reason. I'm not going to mess with that anymore because my time is winding up. But secondly, as I said, by being his body's thirst, Jesus, our incredible Jesus, after all he's been through, he speaks loudly and clearly his triumphant last words from the cross. And no, I'm not going to take anybody's, I know my sister Q, and I'm not going to take your message. But Jesus, always the teacher, always the one to point the way. Always the one to help us recognize our own needs had an additional purpose for choosing the words, I thirst. Now stay with me and pass me say and pray with me. I believe Jesus was giving one final reminder, one final plea from the cross to recognize our own need for a savior. One way for us to recognize that we are all truly thirsty. A thirst that cannot be quenched by any beverage. Now listen, I love propel water. Sister Tia, you, you, you can confirm that. My sister Mika, sister Lawanda, there it is right there. I love propel water. It has vitamins in it. And it's supposed to quench you. It's kind of like Gatorade, but it's so much better. Just doing a, you know drink propel but even that can't quench my thirst and I love propel I was willing to walk all over Miami do you remember trying to look for some propel because I was thirsty but I couldn't find it but Jesus Jesus. It's the ultimate thirst quencher. He is the best drink that you will continuously to ever have. No, no, you can't just take a shot of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, Reverend. Straight with no chaser. But, 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 but you can't take a shot of Jesus. You got to drink from the fountain that never runs dry. And that brings me to the verse in the book of Amos, chapter 8 and 11 says, Behold. That means pay attention. Stop what you're doing. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God. When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. Now, Matthew 5 and 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Is anybody in here thirsty? Are you thirsty yet? I got a few more verses for you. John 7, 38 through 39 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I got one more for you. And then I'm going to get out the way. Psalms 42 and 2 says, My soul thirsts. For God, 
for the living God. Now, as I close, in John 4, 13 through 14, those are the verses. Jesus said to the woman at the well, whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water I will give him. Now, women, I want you to understand you're not excluded from this text. But the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up eternal life. And so I close with this declaration. And I pray that those in the audience out there in the congregation, that you can say with me, Lord, I thirst. Lord, I thirst. Lord, I thirst. Hallelujah. Lord, I thirst. Oh, Lord, I thirst. I think I'm going to need to stop and shout right now. I need to just shout right now and thank you, God, because you have quenched my thirsty soul. And I think, I think, I truly have the good news because it is finished. Hallelujah. He has quenched my thirsty soul. To God be the glory. Father God, thank you, God for this divine moment, Father God, this divine time, Father God, to celebrate, Father God, your goodness, your grace, your salvation, Father God, for all that you've done on this good Friday, God. So, Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, God, will continue to be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. Thank you, God. Giving honor to God, who is truly Lord over my life, my beloved under-shepherd, my first lady, my husband, my family, and my friends, I greet you all in the matchless name of Jesus. Today I have been assigned to preach the sixth word, and I'll be reading from the book of John, chapter 19, verse 29 through 30. Book of Gospel of John, 19, 29 through 30. And it reads like this. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. My title of the sermon will be, Paid in Full. Paid in Full. As we come together on this day, Good Friday, I would like to share the good news, which is the sixth word on the cross that Jesus spoke. It is finished. The sixth spoken word of Jesus, it is finished, is found only in the Gospel of John, and its Greek meaning is tele- telestia, paid in full. Tetelestia, paid in full. By his blood, Jesus saves from the cross to the grave. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said it is finished, and what was paid in full? I'm glad you asked. When Jesus spoke these words, he was declaring that the sin debt owed his father, God, was wiped away completely and forever. Now get this, not that Jesus owed the debt to his father, rather Jesus eliminated the debt owed by mankind, the debt of sin, my sins and your sins. For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. Why would Jesus pay a debt he did not owe? simple for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life greater love has none than this than to lay down one's life for his friend he calls me friend and he calls you friend and what man of love is this I can't even comprehend it but I know I'm ready I'm ready to comprehend and lay hold of the love that has apprehended and laid hold of me Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. God knew due to Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden, man would fall from grace and we all will be born with a sinful nature. Our sinful nature will separate us from God and we will walk according to the desires of our own flesh. 
we will be like the blind leading the blind, a sheep without a shepherd, not knowing our purpose, walking in darkness, yet thinking we have the answers to life. God's plan of salvation draws us back into relationship with him. God created us for companionship and relationship with him. God also wants us to use, to use us as part of his plan for kingdom building here on earth. It was God's divine plan of salvation to die for our, our sins, to draw us back to him so that we can live with him in a love relationship as born again believers, Christ-like ones. Like Jesus, we must lay down our lives, which is our own nature, and die daily to our fleshly ways. We have to crucify our sin nature, which is our flesh, so we will no more go whining and sinning of the wilderness of our lives. Paul said it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he gave himself for you. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul learned quickly that his steps must be ordered by God and God alone. He left the life of a persecutor of Christians and became a preacher of the gospel because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, on the way to the cross and during Jesus' final ministry, his deity was still being questioned. Some did not believe that he was the Messiah, the anointed one. He was mocked and he was scorned and his authority was questioned and he was tortured. In the book of John, which is one of the main purposes of this book, is to reveal the deity of Jesus as creator and Messiah. This leads us to the revelation of Jesus in the book of Genesis, which means the beginning. In Genesis, God stated, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The us represents the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father is God, Son is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the power, the nature, and the personality of God. Man created absolutely nothing. Naked we came in this world, and naked we will leave. We cannot even breathe without the air God created. So my point is this. From eternity, Jesus, the incarnation of God, had a hand in creation of the universe and all that is in it. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Jesus made it clear, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Hallelujah. Jesus is God's expression of himself. Jesus is God's message to mankind. God is like Jesus and Jesus is like God. Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is the incarnation of God. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. God sent his son Jesus to a virgin and called his name Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah, God. Jesus came to die for our sins. He laid his life down. No one, no one could take his life. The blood of Jesus is the propitiation and the payment for our sins. Thank you, God. So, where, so who were those religious rulers of Jesus' day who were stuck on the law and traditions of their fathers? Pontius Pilate, the Sanhedrin, describes the Pharisees and other Roman leaders and kings who had the audacity to think they could stop Jesus from finishing what he had started. He started his mission of love before the beginning of time, before the foundation of the world. He always was and always will be king of kings and lord of lords. He started by stepping down from his divine throne and wrapping himself in flesh and coming down to the portals of heaven to save you and to save me. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus had to contend with the misinterpretation of those who, was, who, who misinterpreted his mission and who he was. From the beginning of time, from Genesis to Malachi, there are over three 300 specific prophecies detailing the coming of the anointed one, all fulfilled by Jesus. From the seed who will crush the serpent's head, to the suffering servant of Isaiah, to the prediction of the messenger of the Lord, John the Baptist, who will prepare the way for the Messiah. All prophecies of Jesus' life, ministry, and death were fulfilled and finished on the cross. Jesus even had to ask his own disciples, his followers, who do you say that I am? But ultimately, it did not matter what the non-believers thought, for Jesus knew who he was and why he came. 
and as a word of encouragement to you and to me today, don't be upset. Because if the high priests and scribes and Pharisees and Roman rulers, and at one time, at one point, even John the Baptist questioned who Jesus was. Your friends and family may not know or believe who you are in Christ Jesus. But it's all right. It's all right. They called Jesus a wine bibber and said his works were of the devil. People may say you'll be nothing. You'll be stupid. You're broke. You're drugging. You're a fornicator, adulterer, hopeless, and weak. The questions for us today is, do we know who Jesus is? Do you know who you are? And are you fulfilling your purposes in life? Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, knew who Jesus was and wanted no part of crucifying Jesus, the innocent son of man. The other religious leaders wanted to crucify Jesus, but could not get Pontius Pilate to change his mind. Pontius Pilate said he could not find any fault in Jesus. He told the leaders, I said what I said. I am washing my hands, for the blood of Jesus will not be on my hands. Pontius Pilate refused to crucify Jesus, an innocent man in vain. Today, believers, will we ensure we do not take the wonder-working power of the blood of Jesus in vain and go back to our old nature, our old sins, our old habits, and our old mindset, taking the shed blood of Jesus in vain? Let us be the blood-washed redeemed, born again, victorious, Christ-like believers in Jesus. Jesus is alive. And the unbelief did not stop Jesus from fulfilling his purpose here on earth. Don't let it stop you. Jesus walked the earth human but yet divine, and he could be touched with our infirmities. For we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Thank you, God. So how did Jesus pay our sin debt? Jesus fulfilled the blood covenant. Jesus became our sacrificial lamb. He was the innocent but yet slain for our sins that we might live. Thank you, Jesus. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There can be no life without the blood. Something has to die. The basis of Christianity is rooted in the blood covenant. In the Old Testament, the unconditional blood covenant was between God and Abraham. This blood covenant is the foundation for the relationship of God to his chosen people. God chose the Jewish people to represent him in the world and promised to bless the entire world through Abraham's seed. Abraham's blood contribution was to be his foreskin, which was circumcision. At this time, the covenant was with all circumcised males. This covenant appears in the New Testament as a new covenant, and this time between God and those who choose to serve him in Christ. His covenant Christians who chose God willingly to represent Christ to a dying world. There is a covenant, a blood covenant between God and Jesus. The old blood covenant was between God and Abraham, and that was the Abrahamic covenant. But in each case, the meaning of the blood covenant remains the same. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. God said life is in the blood of the flesh so that there can be no life without the blood. And please note now, as we talk about the covenant, realize that our ultimate focus is on human blood and not particularly in the blood of, and particularly in the blood of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. For in his blood was not just physical life, but also eternal life. Finally, to fulfill the blood covenant, which is his divine plan of salvation between Jesus and God, Jesus spoke to six words. It is finished. And he bowed his head and he handed over the spirit. Jesus' body died, but not his spirit. Not his spirit. Not his spirit. Not his spirit. His spirit is drawing us to him today. He is alive with the keys of heaven, hell, and the grave. He openly shamed the devil. He openly shamed the devil. Hallelujah. And has all power in his hands. We serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. By the power of Jesus' spoken words, which are sharper than any two-edged sword, they pierce through the darkness of any and all evil forces that tries to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It is finished, and that is a good news today. 
Jesus asked, do you think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus did not come to preach a message of coexistence or tolerance. Jesus made it clear that you are either with the one true God or you are against him. He said, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. Jesus came to do and finish the work of his father. Jesus came as the light of the world, giving fallen mankind the opportunity to move from utter darkness into his marvelous light. The sin that you and I owe was paid in full on the cross. It was finished when the angels asked the woman at Jesus' tomb, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus came to die and purify his bride, the church. That's me and that's you. The suffering of Jesus was finished at the cross. He finished it for Abraham and gave him an everlasting covenant with him. He finished it for David and through Jesus, David's kingdom reigns forever. Ever. He finished it for the centurion soldier who pierced Jesus' side, yet he had to confess truly this was the Son of God. He finished it for the woman at the well when he offered her, offered her water. She had, he offered her rivers of living water and she never thirsted again. He finished it for the woman with the issue of blood who just needed to touch the hem of his garment and she was made whole. He finished it for Hannah who was barren and gave her a son Samuel who became one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. He finished it for Job for he restored all he had lost. He finished it for you and he finished it for me and by his mercy we are not consumed. Thank you God and to God be the glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, there's another word. There's another word. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and take that. See, my girl know me because I've been dropping stuff all day. So you can go ahead and leave that there because I'm scared I'm going to have to pay for that speaker if you leave it right there. Amen. Now, I don't know if y'all was counting, but I collected four extra minutes. Minus the one I gave Minister Tasha. So I got three extra minutes. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. Come on, let's rest on your feet for the final word. Hallelujah. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 23. Verse 46. And Jesus called out with a loud voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Why don't you give your neighbor my sermon title for just a few minutes. Say, neighbor, what will you sing? Look at your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, what will you sing? Amen. You may take your seats. Hallelujah. It was now about three o'clock in the afternoon. And darkness covered the whole land. The sun at this point refused to shine. The curtain in the temple which closed off the most holy place, symbolizing man's separation from God, was split in two, giving us now direct access to God the Father. After this, the text record that Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, not the Holy Spirit, nor his divine nature, but his human soul. For he was indeed 100% divine and 100% human. You see, without his humanity, Jesus would not have been the perfect sacrifice as a sin offering to redeem us back to God. And now as he's getting ready to make his transition, 
Jesus decided for his final soliloquy to recite the words of another song. As we say on, sun, on Communion Sunday, he sang a hymn and went out. Just as he referenced the song when saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We find once again moments before his demise that Jesus purposefully pulled from the words of a psalm of David found in Psalms 31. And in doing so, Jesus communicates three messages. First, he expressed trust in God. With the words quoted from the cross, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He put his life into the hands of his father, not his mama, not his disciples, not his, 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 his followers who ended up being fickle. But he put it in the hands of the one who had proven to be the rock. A fortress, a trusted God, the one who has proven to be faithful. Secondly, he used this psalm. In using this psalm, Jesus sends a series of positive notes of praise and of trust. And finally, Jesus no longer addressed God, but you and I. He gives us in this psalm, as the teacher, some final words of instruction he said love the lord be strong and take courage you see the overarching theme of this song and christ's message for us today is to trust god no matter what jesus continually modeled in front of us how to live a victorious life you see minister hope as you said he spoke the word he sung the word he lived the word <laughs> john said he was the word and in this last word it was the word and it's interesting to note as a sidebar, I was so tickled by this. It was interesting to note that throughout this Calvary experience, Jesus decided to use Satan's area of expertise to communicate. As you remember, Jesus, Lucifer, also known as Satan, was the chief musician in heaven before his termination and evicting at eviction adding insult to satan's crushing defeat look at your neighbor say checkmate checkmate and i can only imagine that if jesus was with us here at east friendship today this service he would add just a few more stanzas to this final word by singing into my father's hands i commit my spirit so that into your hands I can give you the power to plead the blood and call upon the name of Jesus. That's whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will give it to you. You see, in my Father's hands, I commit my spirit so that into your hands you can receive the power to forgive as I have forgiven you. Into my Father's hands, I commit my spirit so that into your hands I can place the right to the tree of life so that one day you too can be with me in paradise into my father's hands I commit my spirit so that you can become my mother and that you can become my brother because you do the will of my father into my father's hands uh, I commit my spirit so that into your hands I can give you the security of knowing I'll never leave you or forsake you <laughs> into my father's hands I commit my spirit so that living water can flow from your belly so you'll never thirst again into my father's hands I commit my spirit so that in your hands you can receive power to finish the race with endurance the race that God has set before
for you. Oh, there is another word. The word is in you. It's a living word. The word that will give you power to walk right. Power to talk right. Power to live right. I can hear Jesus singing what the words he gave the tie tribbit. If they only knew what I was going to be after the storm, they wouldn't have even bothered me. Hallelujah. So my question for you, my brothers and sisters, is what will you sing? What will you sing? When the pressures of life pushes you to a breaking point. What will you sing to gather yourself? To help you remember the complete work that was done on Calvary's cross. What will you sing when the bill collectors are calling but your bank account is empty? What will you sing in the middle of the night when you long to be held, but there are no arms available? What will you sing when temptation is knocking at your door and you need a way of escape? What will you sing when the doctor's report is not favorable? What will you sing when your screaming children keep you from entering into a peaceful night's what rest? What will you sing? Well, I don't know what you sing. <laughs> but I tell you what I sing. <laughs> I'd sing God me, O thou, great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. I'd sing, I love the Lord. <laughs> He heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live and trouble ride, I'll hasten unto his throne. I sing there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. I sing the blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary, all oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. You see, it soothes my doubts and it calms my fears and it dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power for it reaches the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. You see, some way in there it reaches me. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, from day day to day. I said it will never, never lose. I said it will never, never lose its power. Come on, thank God for the blood. Come on, thank God for the blood. Are you excited about the blood? Are you excited about the power of the blood? Hallelujah. Thank him for the sacrifice. Thank him for his Holy Spirit. Thank him because he loves you just that much. Hallelujah. 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 God bless you. The blood. Come on, y'all. The blood. The blood. 